Kia ora and welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod as we look forward to the semi-finals of the World Cup in the context of what was an incredible weekend of quarterfinals for outstanding games, particularly the France-South Africa game and the All Blacks versus Ireland game, two of the best rugby games you'll ever see in your life. We'll get into those. Have they all played their finals? <laughs> you have to ask, because they were all final quality games. The guts, the glory, we'll talk about it all. The psychology and the science of recovering from a game like that and managing to be up for it. We'll talk a bit about Ireland and the choke. Is it a choke? I don't know. It was a great game of rugby and, and why they can't get over that hurdle. South Africa, their innovation in and around HIAs and around the rest of their game. Another superb outing from them, including some really interesting approaches to certain aspects of the game. And Sam Kane, put respect on his name. <laughs> we'll be getting into that as well. So, joining me, James Parsons, Av Ever. What a weekend. Oh, mate. Uh, like, I couldn't agree with you more. I think those, you know, we were... So excited after that Irish South African game, but those two games on the weekend, the other two quarters were great as well. But uh, just the intensity and the level of physicality um, in New Zealand, Ireland, and, and obviously the one on Monday morning, South Africa, France, just oh, simply sensational. It's just what the game needed, I feel like. I feel like a lot of fans that have probably fallen out, out of love mm. um, with the game have, have definitely jumped back on the bandwagon. It's, it's, it's great for all black supporters as well. As, yeah, I was extremely proud um, of that, that effort they put on. I was certainly in that camp. As a cynical journalist, I spent a lot of time following the All Blacks. <laughs> and I suppose I'd fallen, fallen out of love. You know, I felt kind of disenfranchised, disenchanted, having followed them closely and been involved in the NZR machine. At times, you become cynical. <laughs> I was out of my chair. Oh, yeah. I was shouting stuff. I was leaning into every ruck and more like I was clearing bodies out, yeah. you know? <laughs> I, I, I was yelling so much, my daughter started crying, the poor, poor girl. She didn't quite know what was going on at 8 a.m. in the morning that there was bringing that much uh, entertainment. But, um, yeah, it was just a, an awesome moment. Yeah, and Bryn Hall can join us from Japan, not Hawaii, Japan this week. Bryn, your heart won out over your head. New Zealand over Ireland. Yeah. Oh, God, I'm not going it's down that track. It's certainly good. It's, um, look, just what a result, I think. You know, you look at the way the game started, we'll go into it in a lot more detail, but like, you know, 30 phases to start the game and then 37 phases defensively to, to finish that game. I don't think I've ever seen a team defend for that long of a period. And if you talk around being proud, yeah, I was a pretty proud Kiwi being in, um, in Japan watching that because yeah, you could see when the final whistle went, our men were just absolutely had nothing left in the tank. So, yeah, and then even the French game as well, DuPont, man. It's almost a shame that we don't get to see him anymore, guys. Because, God, he, he was he was unbelievable. So, yeah, I look forward to seeing um, and talking around um, that result with the French and South Africans as well. I saw an interesting thing on TikTok that someone had to explain to me how to use TikTok to start with. So, um, But an interesting thing on TikTok from Will Greenwood, he said rugby's not one on paper or algorithms or by supporters' opinions. It's one on downright dirty, dogged mongrel. <laughs> and that is true. Yeah, it certainly was for those two test matches. Like, um, if you look at the defensive effort of the, the All Blacks and South Africa, you know, probably... All the opportunity was with um, with Ireland um, and France in terms of the statistics, in terms of territory and possession and opportunities in the 22. But um, we, we spoke about the defence needing to be like red hot for both those sides because Ireland and France, you know, have shown such um, impressive attack. You know, you got the flair of Dupont, which you sort of don't know what he's doing. He knows what he's doing, but he's very hard to defend. And then the structure of bodies in motion of Ireland, um, for the first time, um, you know, it, it just looked a little bit laboured in that last last period. And and I suppose that pressure and expectation of winning, um, you know, just added to that frustration. We talk around that break breakdown area on the offensive side and the defensive side. Look, Sam Kane in that first 20 minutes and Artie Severe, and they were men possessed and around getting turnover breakdowns very early in that game to try and um, slow down their ball. And I think for Ireland as well, they were a little bit um, isolated in, in a lot of their runnings early on, going back the same way. And I thought defensively, you know, our identify identify where the where the attack was was really good, both sides of the ruck. And then I talked around, I was a little bit worried around defensively, us, um, you know, making 230 or tackles. But what I was really impressed with our defense system was that if you look on the edges, you know, the likes of Artie Severe, our loose forward trio, even Cody Taylor, who was defending on the edge a lot in face play shape, were really good in and around their connections and identifying who was in front of them and then making those tackles with that animation um, that the Irish were doing. So I was a little bit worried because they weren't going to bring that line speed, but 
the decision making and the connections that the All Blacks boys, especially our loose forward trios and our forwards in those positions, the areas that I talked about, were really, really good. We tap it at 90%. And, you know, you look at Ireland, they made 302 passes to our 150. You know, so they put us under a lot of pressure defensively. And then the breakdown area as well, we'll touch on. I thought we, we were very, very good at around that, both defensively and, and our attack as well. Cody Taylor, some of his defensive efforts, um, getting back, making that tackle after a line break, he did double efforts. His acceleration, you know, he came with the line, but then accelerated to, to shut down any sort of bodies in motion and, and get guys ball and all. Um, I thought it was the best test he's played in, in some time, maybe the best test he's ever played. He was, he was you know, it, there were individual standouts, but, um, you know, as a team and as individuals, it was, it was probably all of their, yeah. their best test. I mean, not a lot of people gave them a chance. Mm. You know, like, it, it was, there was, Talks of, you know, if you use Johnny Sexton for example, during the week he was talking about, you know, it couldn't, you could ne when he was growing up, you couldn't dream of um, Ireland winning the World Cup, and he was like, now we're making it a reality, and it's like, well, mate, you're at the quarterfinal, you know, like it, 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 there was there was quite an expectation that this was just going to be a walkover, um, so you know they they took it personally, a lot of those players, and you heard Ardy say after that they held on to some receipts um, of of what sort of went on in New Zealand, and 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 they. Um, I suppose, got the payback that they were looking for <laughs> at the biggest moment. You know, like, if you look at the All Blacks previous in the World Cup, you know, we're probably the team that's like Ireland and we're, like, impeccable in between and then for some reason we've always had our hurdles, mm. at, um, you know, getting through World Cups. And it's like, I don't know, if you ask the fans, would you be happy to go through what we've been through if we go on to win this World Cup? And I think most fans would say, yeah, we'll take the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. Um, you certainly do feel for the Irish in that way because we can relate. We've been there. Five straight World Cups, wasn't it? And it was it was tough to go through. So what happened, Bryn, with the All Blacks when you're looking at them getting over that hurdle that Ireland need to hold on to in order to turn around eight years of being the best in the world and not getting anywhere when it came to the big dance? I don't think that they're there that far away. If they meet another another team in their quarterfinal, they probably go through a semi-final. But the, the way the draw was, they played the All Blacks. It was like a final, and they weren't able to get over the hump. But to finish off that to finish off that question, Ross, it's maybe just going a little bit deeper, accepting that it is a bit of a problem. It's a problem now they have in that in that in that squad, and the players, the the leaders, and the management really going deeper, like the All Blacks did with Richie McCall when they lost that 2007 final for that pressure that we had. Yeah, I think they did a couple of things um, after 07. One was what Bryn says, but I think what they stripped it back to is what, are the, what did we stand for? Mm -hmm. And then once they got clarity on what they stood for, then they held themselves accountable to that every day. So that weight of expectation or pressure was actually generated within the side so that when you got to, you know, a standalone test match versus the World Cup, nothing sort of changed in terms of what they expected themselves. So they almost um, created more pressure in the environment so that it became the norm and, and I mean there was a lot of weight of expectation mm. on Ireland and I think out of the back of this experience they'll be better for it having experienced it, um, you know they won't be happy about it but um, I think they'll be better placed to deal with that if they do come into the next tournament at number one and even if they don't they can almost see what's capable from an All Blacks point of view when you know, going into this tournament, lo losing to France, um, you know, now in a semi-final and, and no one sort of gave them an opportunity. It's, it's that knockout rugby is just, it's brutal and, and you just can't, you just cannot miss, miss a beat. Um, and two sides are going home um, that, that are quality enough to win it. Now, in 2019, a lot was said about the All Blacks beating Ireland in the quarter-final as if they played their final and then they went in against England and they dropped the ball completely. So the big question here is, and for the Springboks as well, although I, I doubt it's as much of an issue for them because they do crazy stuff <laughs> and it's always fun and they have a very, way of innovating. Very, very. But how do you go about recovering from a game like that, psychologically, physically, to make sure that when you get to that next game against Argentina, that you're in the same place that you were the week before, you know, which I'm sure after playing Ireland is a quite a hard thing to do. Oh, massive, and I, I think the first few days become critical. Like, obviously, recovery is straightforward from a physical point of view. Um, they'll have processes in place um, with Nick Gill and that. But I suppose from that psychological point of view, like that that week would have taken a hell of 
a lot out of them mentally, mm. you know, because there was a lot of, you could see the passion and the want and the desire, and you know, Aaron Smith at the end and um, all, all of what it means, but I think actually just getting away from rugby, like a lot of them got their family over there for the first few days and, and not rushing into, um, you know, Argentina and, you know, trying to sort of solve the issues of that. Um, but I think getting away from rugby, ha having a breath, coming back sort of fresh and feeling fresh, um, will, will be critical in, in shaping this week. And don't forget, there's a lot um, riding on our, I suppose, uh, test matches against Argentina as well. Like, mm. they've got a few records against us um, recently, you know, winning it in New Zealand. And um, there's, you know, similar to, you know, the, the I suppose, the on field uh, banter when Ireland won, you know, um, uh, Argentina have certainly uh, served some out so within the squad they'll have a few as they call it receipts mm. um, on this so I think that their focus is there and but I think the most important thing out the back for this side is they'll not that they didn't believe but man they have to believe they can go on and win this thing now and I think that will be quite yeah. uh, you know refreshing mentally mm. rather than that weight and pressure of everyone just you know thinking you're not going to be able to do it it'll I feel could potentially be freer but you have heard everyone speak, you know, Fozzie and Sam have mentioned we have to keep our feet on the ground, like we cannot get caught into the same trap. I think the best thing around those kind of weeks as well is that, you know, the load is actually, it's very, very low. You've, you've done all your kind of stuff throughout the year and you look at that World Cup stage, you've done all the hard yards early in the competition. So as a player, it's actually probably a lot easier in terms of your recovery. Talk around a big performance like that, you do get a chance to reset. You have a couple of days to be able to try and enjoy that, have the conversation, spend family time. But when you do come back, there's not a lot that changes in your in your game plan. It's pretty lean. You've got a really clear understanding, and it's probably more so the recovery element earlier in the week. So the ability to go have coffees, to be able to go talk within your teammates within the team room and talk, go in that kind of really deepest prep is really easy in those kind of final weeks because not a lot changes. So. I used to always enjoy those weeks. I'm not obviously at a World Cup, but playing, you know, back-to-back quarterfinals, semifinals against, you know, um, New Zealand teams, I always found that the conversations that you had off the field were way more important than actually being on the field because all that work's done earlier in the competition. I think that's what's interesting about this Argentina lineup is when you look at what the All Blacks did well on the weekend, it was the areas that they've failed in the two times that they've lost to Argentina. The loose forwards, you know, when Argentina have beaten them, Crema and Matera and Issa have just put on a clinic, yeah. you know, and they've dominated them there. And Buffelli's kicked from everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, and that's what, he, that, he was a big part of them just chipping away um, on, the, on the weekend. So, you know, it's going to be the same old story. Like, discipline is going to be crucial, and they, they do have different tactics to Ireland. They're not going to kick to the corner. Um, and, and early on in the game, they, they are going to take their points. And that scoreboard pressure, as we've seen, creates its own internal in-game pressure. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that's what we saw um, for the Irish team is they, they probably hadn't experienced that internal game pressure of, of that scoreboard of sort of chasing and, and being behind and watching the clock run out. And, and that's when mm -hmm. probably the first time we've seen their attack fail mm -hmm. in that last sort of period. You'd have to think they're a team that can go phase after phase after phase. They've got the same system. You almost thought they were going to break them down and win, mm. um, but they just didn't have that punch. Um, and, and I suppose we have to talk about, and I, I've, I've been proven wrong in this, because I did say Ireland, I like the way Ireland had named their main 23. Mm -hmm. They had big minutes, um, and maybe, you know, you look at the management, I think the South African side, we got sent something last week, the South African side and the New Zealand side were the most like balanced minutes yes. in terms of the teams that were going into the quarter final. Um, and I think that will pay dividends this week. Mm. Probably like going into last week, maybe not as, as drastic, but after that big collision based game for both sides, it, it probably sets them up really well going into another semi final. Mm. I think the South Africans probably are the best at having changed their side up and played in multiple different ways, aren't they? Like yeah. they, they will try things and they'll do different things, Bryn, where they. They're happy to then go into a semi-final and say, we're making seven changes from the team that beat France. Whereas New Zealand's more likely to be, okay, we're sticking to our guns. Yeah, well, that's, that's the great thing about the depth of the South Africans, isn't it? And look, I thought for that French game, when they bought all in their, uh, bought all in their, uh, their reserves, they had a massive impact. And you look at Faf de Klerk and Andre Pollard coming on early doors. We talked around thinking that Andre Pollard should have started. But, you know, look, I thought the box game management, the way that he played in that first 40 minutes, 
probably set up the team then for, to bring a Pollard on and change the game plan and goal kicks being very, very important that we talked about at the back end of the game was massive. And you talk around their scrum, their set piece, their big men coming on to be able to win collisions and be able to win that contact area. Um, yeah, they've got it really good in and around their bench coming on and really having a massive impact. And so and more, I, that's where I probably thought with the Irish, I know we're going back a little bit, but I thought their, their bench didn't do as much as that, you know, the South Africans or that we did. And I think the likes of taking, um, you know, Van der Fleer off. Not too sure why they would have taken a guy like that, who I think was pretty good in around that turnover area with Doris. And I think when that when he went off, the turnover game, they didn't get any in their last 20 minutes, the the, the Irish team, you know. So whereas us, we had eight turnovers for the game and, um, and the Irish had five, you know. So I just didn't think they looked as um, as clinical in the sense of both on and off the ball um, with the Irish in their last 20 minutes. But the South Africans, yeah, their full 23-man squad for a game day um, is very, very impressive and we massive going forward in these semi-final final stages. That's so good at the breakdown like South Africa and, and the impact yeah. they got from Quagga Smith today was probably match defining. Mm. Um, and I know the penalty he got, his hand touched the grass and it wasn't straight on the ball, but um, you know, Ben is human, he, he didn't see it from that side. But 11 turnovers they got at the breakdown to, to France's six, mm. um, which, is, which is massive. I know they had not much ball, um, or, or, or territory, so they had more opportunities at the defensive breakdowns. But that is quite a substantial number. When you look at when you look at um, what what was it? Um, Sixty-eight percent territory, sixty percent possession to France, and they couldn't put them away. And it was all because there was just these efforts at breakdown turnovers at crucial times when they were just getting momentum. Um, and that was that was the winning and losing. Yep, a great kicking from Pollard to get them ahead. But I, again, I think the breakdown um, was was the point of difference in both games. Bryn, one of the amazing things about the All Blacks that I found in those last five minutes was how disciplined they were to not put their hands in, not come in from the side as Ireland mounted phase after phase after phase. This is a team that cops more yellow cards than anyone else in the tournament and they managed to keep it together in those last five minutes like they hadn't through the previous parts of the tournament. If you look at the like, their, their game manager, I've written it down here, the game management understanding how to win this game. So I've written it down a little bit. So 72nd minute, we do a pretty much a piston setup shape around half of the field, be able to use the rucks, be able to build pressure. We go to a contestable kick off that, get good pay off that. Richie Mwanga does a does a little kick after eight phases, puts them to the goal line. They've got to be able to do a line dropout. That sucks another two to three minutes off. Then they do a drop goal. Bowden Barrett does another drop goal from the from the halfway line. Takes another to two minutes. So before actually the Irish were able to go for that three minute, 37 phase defenses, we actually sucked off about six and a half, seven minutes. I've been able to slow down the ball. Wasn't again trying to attack or be able to score points. It was trying to close out the game and game management moments from Bowden Barrett, Richie, Richie Mwanga, and you have had Aaron Smith around game managing that role. And then, look, 37 phases of defense. The areas that I touched around, Cody Taylor, especially, you know, Cody Taylor and before that, obviously, but I think even all the defensive people in in place for that 37 phases, it's a tremendous effort, Jip. I, I've talked around, I've been a part of teams that have done 19, 20 phases, let alone 37 phases of defense, not to give away a penalty not to be able to do a misread and collectively being in the right position at the right time. Look, I so yeah, I think that was probably one of the best performances in closing out a game, I think, on the attacking side, game management, but then also defensively to be able to do 37 tackles. I don't know about you, but you've got to have a lot of care within that group and understanding that you're trusting your defense system and your players as well. Oh, and not one player breaking the system. And then we spoke yeah. about the importance of having been there and won a World Cup and been in these uh, knockout moments. And, and it takes a lot of courage to be the person that goes for the turnover, mm. because if you get it wrong, it's a disaster. And, and you could see two guys that almost had the license to do it, but uh, was Artie, he had a, couple of, a mm. couple of goes, but got out of there quickly. And then the man that did the business, Sam Whitelock, you know, 151 tests or 152 now. Um, wow, like that is a massive play. Uh, he, his, his, if you looked at his defensive stats and around his ability to get turnovers just in the World Cup alone, he's one of the top um, forwards in that. But to come on in a big moment and have uh, you know, the courage to be the guy, hmm. 
and it's you either are the guy or you're not, um, was just you know a tip of the cap to the way they selected the side, I think. Um, you, know, you could have easily said he, he'd be a good option to start, but having him come off the bench, um, just the, yeah, the, whole, the way they used their 23, I thought was really smart. You know, even Dalton's impact towards the end. You know, that was the most ball in play at the World Cup, just under 39 minutes, which is why they were all tired. Mm. Um, you know, the sentiment would have been, let's keep Sam out there, you know, he's had a great game, but, you know, he, he'd run himself to a standstill and it, that impact that Dalton actually bought was, you know, albeit five minutes, was, was mm. you know, explosive and just what probably the team needed. Yeah. You know? He's also the guy who hasn't missed a tackle or comp. Like, yeah. he's the most accurate tackler in the competition. So it's a good time yeah. to bring him on. And he's a power tackler too. Like, he's mm. not someone that doesn't... Um, take the risk I suppose in terms of not putting himself in a position to miss you know like he's on those edges channels so um, he's got his game was defensive game in particular in a, in a good spot. Anton Leonard Brown was no. in a similar position. Yeah he was I thought like you know especially in that kind of 37 phases having a guy like Anton Leonard Brown or even when he when he came on the, again the the decision making skills are in and around that defensive system is really good when it comes to Anton Leonard Brown his ability to be able to even clean on a wide ruck whether it being on the attacking side was really good as well. And I think also I want to pay mention to the the two young props that came on as well in the 63rd minute, you know, De Groot and Lomax, you know, ran themselves into a standstill and probably played a little bit more than they wanted, but were great in and around, our, especially our set piece. Um, but to bring out two guys like that to be able to situationally um, do what was needed in that role was pretty was pretty special, I thought, considering, you know, Offa and Nepo are very experienced props that we left out of that team. So... Yeah, collectively, again, the 23 that came on and the, the, the reserves, yeah, they did the job which was needed in that quarter final. When a game has been on the line, especially finals footy, has Richie Moonga ever not stood up? Mm. You know, like, he, there's a couple of players that have just gone under the radar for the role um, they, they played in this game. Bowden Barrett's another one. But, man, like, him to break that line, like, Ireland just have not been broken. He gets a little outside carry inside to Will. That's that's the game. You know, that's the scoreboard pressure that put Ireland under, you know, immense. And you even heard Johnny Sexton say after, we just didn't we didn't make them earn their points. We just gave them to them almost. Yeah. And and they had to really earn theirs, which is the biggest tip of the cap to the All Blacks when he's saying that. Um, but you know, it's those guys have delivered. You know, we look at um, Alice Park. You know, there's, there's test matches when they've been under the pump, they've stood up, and, and I just felt like that performance was coming in the, in the quarterfinals, but you can't guarantee it because there has been ebbs and flows um, throughout the journey, yeah. um, you know, the last 24 months. So um, the, the key will be, as we've already sort of spoken about, is mm. refilling the tank and being able to execute again. Now, Matthew Nixon also emailed us. You can email us on aotearoarugbypod at sky.co.nz or put a comment in the YouTube comment section and we'll get to it and try our very best to answer your questions. We get a few through, so we can't do them every week, but we try our best to get to as many as possible. Matthew Nixon's comment was a doozy. I like the fact that the coaches didn't substitute players automatically. They did it for a reason, Bryn. Aaron Smith played out that entire game. You know, having guys in those positions and understanding big match footy, um, you try to keep them on as best as possible. And Aaron Smith, again, kind of got a feeling early on that how the game was going, you weren't probably going to bring a Finlay Christel unless, you know, Aaron was, um, you know, he was bringing himself into the ground. But having that yellow card probably gave him the opportunity to um, to stay on the field. And like I said, in that last 10 minutes, his game management alongside Richie, Bodie, Geordie, and all those guys making the decisions around where we need to be on the field was paramount in that last 10 minutes. So, again, yeah, it was a really good feel, I thought, from Fozzy, like I touched on with, uh, with the props coming on at that specific time. Um, yeah, they were really good in around their time and in bringing in players to be able to influence the game. And like a lot of them that we've talked about, they were able to do the job when they did come on. It was, it was massive. Like, I think that point that you just made in terms of managing that last sort of 10 minutes is exactly why you couldn't bring them off. And you couldn't... It wasn't really about Christie or um, McKenzie. It was literally what was out there, they were in the moment, they were in full control, and the laser focus that those three three guys had, um, there, there was, they were they were in sync, there was no way anyone would, would be thinking to pull them off. Mm. Now, Aaron, I know, so, so, go on. just lastly on that, you know, Bowden Barrett's been given a lot of, a lot of slack, you know, for his positioning being a, in a fullback, but if you actually watch him, we can watch it on Huddle, it's on, we get um, been able to watch from all different views, you look at his, 
his, his communication when Richie isn't at a ruck or Geordie's in at a ruck and he's in that second pivot role, his communication skills in and around talking to specific players, telling them what the core was, he was the guy out there being able to give those communication skills. In. And in, that's why it's so important, I believe, that a guy like that at fullback who has a really good understanding as a 10 was great in and around that game management and helping out Richie, Aaron and Geordie in this situation. So, yeah, big pat on the back, I thought, for, um, for Bodie in that positioning as well. Don't underestimate his role defensively with his voice either. That defensive performance yep. comes through a lot of connection and clarity. That last 37 phases comes from everyone being on the same page and understanding it. And the guy at the back is the one that gives you that understanding um, with probably the, your halfbacks as well. But from a forward's point of view, he's just he just put them in the right position and they just had to execute the tackle and, and make sure they remained on side. So um, yeah, those three guys, and, and like you say, to Bodie in particular, um, you know, big players step up in the big test matches and, and they did it. One of the other big plays in the game was another, what well, seems like innovation from the Springboks coaching panel. Jack Nienaber in the post-match interview spoke about how the coaches um, can help call an HIA. There was an interesting moment where Peter Steff de Toy went off, then Bongi and Nambi went off and it appeared to be kind of like rolling subs towards the end there. Now, technically in the rules, the match doctors, the team doctors, officials can call for an HIA, but a coach can't. But in the post-match press conference, he suggested that they called for it. So I'm presuming that means a call went from them to their team doctor to pull one of their own players off for an HIA at a time when they needed some fresh legs, maybe? It's definitely the first time I've heard a coach say that they have called an HIA. But with the focus around concussions, it is, almost impossible to argue or say it wasn't genuine mm. because I mean if you do that it's just it is a subjective uh, point of view and if they saw a player getting hit and they mentioned it to the doctor like from my point of view if it actually happened then absolutely like no problem with it but it's just it was very convenient timing mm. um, and but I've said it before, and this is what I love about this coaching group and, and this side, is they just, they are who they are. Like, they just, it won't bother them that we're talking about it, anyone else is talking yeah. about it, they'll be... It's the utmost compliment. Yeah. You know, they had Dion Ferry there who could yep. play hooker and flanker. They, they have this ability to move them around. It's hard to imagine it wasn't thought of beforehand. They're smart people, bro. They do it right. So the preparation, you talk around bone deep, preparation for players, that management group and understanding the rules and getting at what they need to do, they do it every single time. So <laughs> I'm not going to say anything more around it because it was very good timing in the sense of how they did it, but they did everything by the rules by by all accounts. They didn't there's no punishments or anything. So fair play to them in their innovative ways to be able to do it. Big bad Russie was uh, giving the old <laughs> cover the mouth as he was talking on that last last 10 to 15. I don't think he sat down. He was he was going hell for leather on the old microphone. The lights were gone. Oh, yeah. He was just yelling. Yeah. There were no lights yeah, left. No, no, no. There's no, no time for that. Yeah. There's no time for those games today. <laughs> was, uh, yeah, he, he definitely... You feel when the game's in the balance, he really is the main guy, isn't he? Yeah. You know, he's, he, he seems to be the one that has final say when, when it's right on, on the line. Mm, mm. He definitely is. And a lot of their plays were so clever. Like that little tap penalty play, even though it didn't necessarily make do, they had something cool in there. They could have gone for the posts. That could have cost them the game. But they had a little play there and they went for it, you know. And Chisholm Colby coming in for a drop goal uh, at halfback. Yeah. I mean, um, all those could be the difference. Like they. Well, Cheslin Colby, the difference was quite possibly the fact that he charged down a conversion. Incredible. That was, I, I actually forgot about that. Is it the box? Are the box the team that now should be considered favourites considering what we know about them? Not to go past us, you know, I think. You did last week. Jeez, he's bloody taken a turn. <laughs> hey. Well, in terms of like, the Irish team for me was the biggest scare. I just think with how they played and what they were going to do to us, more so on the attacking side and what I was thinking defensively, I was a little bit worried in the sense of what they looked like for us. But, you know, South Africa beating France the way that they did, very opportunity, you know, to be honest, the tries that they did score were off pretty much 50-50 contestables, especially the first two, and being able to um, use that click attack for one of their tries as well. 
you know, they were pretty clinical in the opportunities that they did have. So um, I would say South Africa and New Zealand would be pretty similar. I'd probably go New Zealand first, to be honest, if I'm being honest, due to that result. But, you know, South Africa, pretty much there or thereabouts. They're pretty much 1A and 1B, I think. Yeah, there's not much between them. So, but South Africa, I, what I have liked is that if they are going to start in the bot, you know, they've got that attacking prowess that he brings and what he, he's able to do. And I thought his game management and around his contest walls is really good. But then, you know, when you can bring on a Andre Pollard with that goal kicking element, along with their bomb squad of their scrum and then their big forward packs that come on, again, I think when if the All Blacks do get through that semi final stage and end up playing the final, very similar to Ireland. The ability to stay on and being able to be ruthless and disciplined how they were on both sides of the ball will be important to get that South African team as well. I think it will, I do think New Zealand and South Africa will be in the final. One concerning area probably for, um, if you look at both sides, one area that would be concerning f for the All Blacks will be Maldi. Mm. You know, that, 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 that's sort of where South Africa took them apart at Twickenham and where Ireland, you know, had Geordie Barrett not made the play of all mm. plays, yeah. um, they, they would have probably won that test match. And then for the South Africans, it's their rush D. Now I know it works, but they tackled at 79% against the French, um, 14 line breaks from, from France, so um, they couldn't finish them off today and that, there was some great desperate defence getting back, but I feel if you give that amount of opportunity, um, and I suppose New Zealand know it's coming, so it's whoever can fix up those, I think, uh, are the two key sort of weak. I'm not saying the South African defence is a weakness, but missing that amount of tackles um, is, you know, is going to put you under a lot of pressure. And yes, it wasn't, you know, France made some of them connect, but they had a lot more, mm. like 14 line breaks, and they didn't win that game is, is pretty surprising. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I still think you have to say the box are. Uh, are there because, you know, like I said last week, I think they have the ability to play, you don't even know how they're going to play, but they've got the ability to play any any which way they feel in, in terms of their bench uh, makeup, um, first five makeup. So um, they're the defending champions, you'd have to give them the favourites tag, but I don't mind that. You know, I, I feel like that chip on the shoulder for the All Blacks and that little underdog mm -hmm. mentality when no one um, expects you to to win, which I think is probably different this week for the semi-final, um, will will be key going into that week. And Twickenham will come into play, I'm sure, in that final week. We're getting ahead of ourselves because Argentina and England are still in this competition. We haven't spoken about England at all yet and their win over Fiji. Uh, another close game, another really exciting encounter. What do you think about England? And do you give them a chance? Because actually, if you look over the last few years, England and South Africa have gone one for one for one for one. They've both won four out of the last eight games. Oh, the more battle will be interesting. You know, both sides back themselves uh, more time. I think um, just their attack still, nine visits to the 22, two tries. Mm. Um, you know, South Africa are going to be a tougher opposition than Fiji. They, they tackled, England tackled at 83% as well. I know Fiji are actually, that's probably not too bad against the Fijian side. Um, but then I just noticed another weird thing. Only four of their forwards carried and then four didn't. It's almost like they've got set roles. Wow. So like, so Earls, Laws, Atoji and Genge did all the carrying in the forwards and then the other four, George, um, I can't remember the other ones off the top of my head, Curry, mm. no carries, like zero carries. Like I've, never, I've never seen that yeah. in my life. They're just cleaning. And some of them played 80 minutes. Tackling and cleaning. So it's almost like, because those four, if you look at it, they're the best carriers. Yes. With ball in hand. Mm. So it's almost like they're saying, we want to make every post a winner, so this is what we're going with, whether it continues or not. But if I was the South Africans, I'd be teeing up on these four. Whenever they're presented in the line, you know they're their main options, so you can really fly up, and that will play into their, their line speed, their rush D, and put these guys under pressure and force these other players that are, are not carrying to have to carry. Um, but I think, I think South Africa get it comfortably, mm. personally. Bryn, if England were to win this game, where would they win it? Well, I think the way that they do play, it's, it's a suffocation game. 
you know, the way that they're able to kick the ball along, don't want to play inside their half, and the effort areas that I talked about last week in and around their ball chase for them, when they do chase it very well and a team doesn't kick off that and they get a line inside their own half and the other team's half, that's when they kind of go to work with their set piece, their line out more, and then be able to, I guess, be more attacking in their face play shape, but obviously not with the, with the only four ball carries that they forward back. But that's the kind of DNA that they do have. They want to make it ugly. They want to be quite, um, put you in positions where it's really hard to attack. So off a contestable kick, being from the foot, from the sideline, teeing off and being really good in around your line speed defense and collectively, I guess, the contact area in and around there. That's how they will try and beat the South Africans. But yeah, good luck to a English team to try and do that. If you, try to, if you want to make a lot of tackles and play without the ball, the way the South African team has shown, they're, they're not afraid to be able to hold the ball for long periods of phases with LeBoc, Willemsa, and, and, and Coda they have as well. So I think South Africa will get the job done pretty um, pretty easy, I think. But you know, I think that's the DNA of how England will try to win this game. Whether they can do it or not for the full 80 um, is yet to be seen. But yeah, I think South Africa win this one quite comfortably. They're going to if if they're going to win it, they have to take risks. Like the moment their attacking plan yeah. doesn't take a lot of risks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as I say, nine entries into twenty two, two tries is because it's just too easy to defend. Yeah. So they are going to have to offload in contact. They're going to have to, you know, find that sort of Dupont magic that breaks down rush defence and and creates opportunity. If if they can do that, because there's no doubt they'll get opportunities in the twenty two. They're very good at getting down there. Mm. <laughs> like every game yeah. they've shown, they can get down there. It's just getting the ball across the line. You talk about people taking opportunities. Well, South Africa and New Zealand were the team that had the least opportunities in the 22, but took the most. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the difference right there. Let's have a quick chat about Fiji before we move on. Obviously, one of the movers and shakers in this competition. They probably weren't as good as we thought they would be towards the end. You know, they didn't quite build into the comp as much as maybe we, we felt they would, yeah. but they, they were still quite impressive against England. Yeah, they still could have got to a semi. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, th I think they'll be disappointed. Mm. I think if there was ever an opportunity in the form they had and um, what they showed... And the draw they and had. And the draw they had, um, this was their time to get into a World Cup semi-final. Um, and he, they're, the sort of the, they're the sort of side that if they just have one of those days to click, they could have gone all the way to the final. But it just wasn't to be. They, they lost their momentum. Um, the, mm. the one pleasing thing, I suppose, is once they bet Australia, they could rotate their squad, which gave themselves a better Chance, opportunity yeah. in this quarterfinal. But in the end, England, um, you know, just sort of you know, smothered them um, mm. in, into the corner and, and big players stood up like Farrell. And Lamani kept on hitting the post. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> which, yeah. Which didn't help which either. Which he hasn't, which was the difference again. Australia is their kicking, I think, could have volley. Um, you know, so yeah. like they, they, all those things sort of play. I think we're going to give the Southern Hemisphere a pat on the back, though, we need Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Clearing, you know, a look up, up north, so it was pretty much going to be a clean sweep from um, from some from some article journals over there. So, well, Sir Clive Woodward. Sir Clive, you said Northern Dominant. You have three, they have three Southern Hemisphere teams in the semi final stage, and only England, in, you know, at the start of the World Cup, England being in there, we definitely didn't think about that. And I know the draw was obviously with the Irish and uh, the French, but. Southern Hemisphere teams, there's three of them. So. Outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding. And if Australia weren't so awful, maybe there would have been an even better chance. <laughs> <laughs> but, they, but they truly, truly were awful. What I find, I suppose, oh, funny on. about it. What's there that? Is, there, is an, there is an Australian. Michael Chica. <laughs> oh. There we go. There we Michael go. Michael Chica. <laughs> he knows how to take... That, uh, that yeah, he knows how to take a team from nowhere to a World Cup final. Michael Checker. Yeah, they'll have to sort out their um, ruck defence. A um, couple of tries went through there. Wales obviously saw it. They came back in with inside balls, so I think the All Blacks should be licking their lips. Mm. And it does bring mm. up the discussion of Roygaard. That's his game. Like, if you look at the opposition, it, it is suited to his sort of running in and around that ruck. Um, it suits our... Um, our, well, I think it suits Will Jordan the most, um, but it would suit mm. um, Leicester and Mark Talia, but just that hovering winger role with an inside ball off uh, Richie Mwonga. Um, even the old school Wellington, you know, cut, drop Geordie underneath. Um, so he yep. cuts with Mwonga and feeds on the inside to a blindside winger coming through because they are, 
I don't know if they they get worried with what's happening out there. They get a little bit too spread. Mm. Um, but it'll be on yep. for Aaron Smith to run. And even if they overcompensate in that um, place because they made so many errors, um, that'll create, yep. obviously, the space on the outside. So um, there yep. are opportunities for the way we play, um, and it, it does suit us in and around some of their defensive frailties. I think one thing as well, I think with the way the Argentinians played, you know, they kicked a lot of ball away. A lot. And been able to... And even their connections in and around their kick chase, man, with the likes of Will Jordan, Mark Tillier, Lester, even, you know, Damon and Bodie there as well, they'll be licking their lips. If they're going to kick it long and give them that many opportunities to counter, um, I saw that's one area I think with the All Blacks will be pretty excited around because they had 34 kicks and had, you know, over almost 1,500 metres worth of kicking, you know, so there'll be a lot of good counter-attack ability opportunities for our All Black boys, and so they'll be licking their lips, I reckon, seeing those pitches from the Argentinians on the weekend. A couple of key areas though, seven penalties, only two in the second half when the game's sort of in the yep. balance. Like their discipline yep. has been an issue previously, but man, it, the, the, the trend they've shown as they've got through this tournament is pretty impressive. 12 turnovers with 60% possession. Like that's accurate. Yep. That's mm. pretty sharp. And it's, you know, they've, they had 11 offloads, so they're starting to get the offload game going. They had three second ball at the breakdown when they got into their half, um, and they won nine turnovers at the breakdown. So. She's. It's. This will be a real test match. This won't be. It's no um, cakewalk. Everyone just like there is this element that everyone just thinks um, it's just gonna. We've done the big one, mm. but this is this. They are such a passionate and emotional um, bunch. You just saw when Creevy got that turnover at the end um, uh, that led to the final penalty. Like it's gonna be a doozy. And their maul. Yeah. Their maul is a weapon. So we need to sort our stuff mm. out there, or our discipline, one or the other. Don't let them get in there to maul, or um, you know, make sure that we can you know, decipher that. It's tough, Bryn. The All Blacks have a tough time of going up and down, up and down and up and down. Yep. When you guys have been in that position with the Crusaders, what has been the key to getting through that little area? I think it just comes about, a lot of it comes down to discipline. You know, I think the more times that you give, especially teams like Argentina, for example, if they've got a very good line out more, you just don't want to be giving penalties away in and around the area to then, you know, to be able to try and get in there, you know. So and I think we talked around it earlier. The times that we have lost test matches against Argentina, we lost the we lost our discipline battle, gave them too many chances, making the flow of the game not so not so quick in our tempo. And then also just our breakdown. You talk around those numbers, Jim, you know, nine turnovers, but, you know, that's a lot of turnovers, and they're very good, not just around their loose ball trio, their outside backs are very good in and around their wide breakdown to try and get turnovers and slow down that ball. So we've made a lot of strides, I believe, in that contact area, especially with our selection of our eight that we've had, especially our loose ball trio, I think, having Kane, bringing back Frizzell's been massive um, in and around there, and Scott Barrett, he cleans rucks at you know, every single time he's in and around there, you know, so that breakdown area sets up everything within our game, so... If we get our discipline right, we'll be sweet, and we win that break that area a lot. I think it'll it'll lead to us having a better result against the Argentinians and not having this banana skin feel. So the Rugby World Cup we've got a couple of semi-finals this weekend. Of course, the women's WXV kicks off the inaugural WXV this weekend. If you're not familiar with what the competition is, there are three different competitions around the world. There's WXV one, two, and three. In each of them, there are six teams. So the three best from the Northern Hemisphere and the three best from the Southern Hemisphere in WXV one and so forth. This weekend, New Zealand will play against France as well as games between England and Australia and Canada and Wales. It's the new competition within Women's World Rugby that'll happen every single year. The idea is it closes the gap and creates constant competition and constant gameplay at the very top level, which is an awesome thing for the Black Ferns especially. So, joining us now, World Cup winning Black Fern, Charmaine McMenamin. Thanks for joining the show. Oh, thanks for having me today. Awesome, awesome. Now, the Black Ferns, I suppose, since you guys took all your titles last year and then you, you've dominated again in the Pack 4, dominated Laurie O'Reilly again, this is the litmus test, isn't it, the WXV with France and England ahead of you? Yeah, I guess it's an opportunity um, for the girls to really stamp their mark again. Obviously, they built through Laurie O'Reilly and um, obviously World Cup last year. They want to continue that performance. Um, new coaches in. Uh, different playing groups, so they'll be looking to really solidify their performance, especially from Laurie O'Reilly heading into France. The French team, they're looking pretty good. They had 
Pretty big wins throughout the Six Nations. They did lose to England, who of course uh, kind of the yardstick up north. But thinking about that French game last year, it was so close, wasn't it? Like history could have been so different if it wasn't for a late kick. So when you look at this French team, what do you see there as the, the largest challenge? Uh, they're just real unorthodox and they'll still bring that. Uh, I think the challenge is, you know, uh, generally as a, um, us as the Black fans, we never really had a kicking game and the Northern Hemisphere teams um, tend, to, tend to have that over us. So... Um, I know the girls will be doing a lot of work around that, especially with Mullies, um, and they'll be looking to probably a space where they can grow in their game is around that kicking kicking game. So I think French, they're a physical pack. Um, like I said, very unorthodox, and it, it'll be an interesting matchup. Malia Po sort of has had to fight her way back into the squad. Um, had a great game, obviously, a couple of weeks back, but I suppose you, you would have played quite a bit um, with her uh, in her earlier years, uh, but pretty pretty impressive. I've been extremely impressed with her um, discipline to stay in the fight and, and work her way back into the squad and now sort of finding a home at 15. She's actually got quite a big boot, and I know in that last game against Aussie, um, they were trying to say, you know, just pull in your boot a bit because she'd probably smack it and go dead. So I know they did a lot of work during the week um, around that and trying to get her to reel in her boot, but um, I think she adds, like I said before about the French, um, she'll add to that kicking game if she's selected, so that'll be something to really watch. It is an, an interesting evolution, isn't it, really? Because when you look at the Men's World Cup right now, kicking is key across the board. Tactical kicking, kicking for distance, it is really such a huge part of the way that a game is structured. Yeah, and we've never really been... I've been in the squad since 2013 and we've never really been a kicking team. We like to run it out of our 22 for some reason, so... Um, we've had some good tens in our tight while since I've been in there. Like we had Vic, Victoria, um, she had a big boot, and then now uh, we've got Lou, and then obviously um, Patricia, who's added or Pet, who's added to that. So um, it's a good evolution, and that's the way we need to head because I think that's one aspect where the Northern Hem Hemisphere teams have it over us. Uh, Charmaine, before we let you go, uh, give us a bit of an update on how you're going. You're out at the moment, so you're not playing in this series. Uh, what does your, your future look like in the short term? Yeah, so I'm um, two months post-op ACL. Uh, blew it in the club finals in Auckland, so uh, not too sure what it holds for me at the moment, but I dabbled a bit in um, coaching with Ngātipo East Coast um, through Heartland, so that was a really cool experience. And um, at the moment, just going to travel around and watch these girls and get them behind them and support them. So um, I'll be training hard, hopefully try to get back for O-picking. It's um, a little bit tight, but we'll see how I how I progress and where I land. And if I land there, then that's cool. And if not, oh well, just is what it is. And is everyone super excited about that double round in O-picking? Because the, the competition's doubled. It's looking like a really cool competition. Yeah, like obviously we played last year and it was kind of, you know, got there and then it was like one round and we we're like oh man especially us at the blues like we were just getting into our stride um as in terms of footy and then competition was over so i think all the teams are going to be super excited um not only that it's the the coin that's getting put into it now the resource i think especially for us at the blues uh we really struggled because most of our girls still work so we found that girls were getting overloaded with content having to be full-time Thursday to Sunday and then having to go still work pretty much 40 hours within those, what, three days of the week. So um, we found that really hard with our group and we had to have like a deload week of like rugby because it was just too much content. So having the, the money, the retainer being put up is awesome for our girls that aren't contracted. Um, that gives them the choice to be able to actually put their full time into footy if that's what they choose. So um, that's a real awesome progression within the competition. And you, th you talk about that content overloading, obviously having that extra time in the pre-season should probably help alleviate when you get into the sort of round rob robin fixtures. Yeah, like there was a restriction put on the pre-season stuff last year. You could only do like a couple of weekends. But yeah, like you said, if we can like front load with that longer pre-season, whatever that may look like, uh, that will help those girls immensely so that when you actually come to just being together and playing those couple of days, everything will flow a lot smoother. As you know, you'd be able to play a lot freer than what we were in that um, condensed competition. So your brain was just full, was it? You just There was just no room left in there once you finished your 40 hours, you got out of rugby, There's just you just want to go to bed. 
yeah, like the girls were just burnt out, eh? Like we were quite lucky because we're contracting, so obviously we just do footy and, you know, it's small things like skill set stuff and then you're talking about maps and, you know, it's quite a lot of content for some girls because they come straight out of club, they go straight into Opiki pretty much. So if you think of the content that's been given at club and then you're going to a super, it, <laughs> it's, a big, it's a big jump, so... Um, some girls handle it really well and then some are just overloaded and put work in whānau on top of that. Um, yeah, it's just like how, it's just amazing how people even done it last year. So um, big ups all those those wahine that got through mahi whānau life and playing footy all at the same time last year. Absolutely. Mm. Hey, well, thank you very much for your time, Charmaine. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the holiday following the ferns. <laughs> yeah, thanks, will do. We look forward to seeing that competition kick off and uh, progress in the years to come and help develop the women's game across the board. So before we go, let's head back to the Rugby World Cup and quickly have a look at what this weekend looks like. Chippa, <laughs> we've covered pretty much everything off, really, haven't we? <laughs> but what, what I really want to know is what you think will be the winning and the losing of the All Blacks versus Argentina. What is the key, one key area? Loose forward trios. I think they'll control the breakdown. We win the breakdown. We've seen it time and time again. You'll you'll win the game. Bryn? Yeah, copy and paste. Forget our breakdown area. It sets up, sets up everything. And Jip talked around the opportunities that we're going to have, especially on the attacking side, around the defence of the Argentinians. But if we don't get our clean out right, it's shown their turnovers within their loose forward trio, similar to us on the weekend. It's going to make it a long day. So, yeah, the breakdown area is going to be massive for us. Well, because... What they, why they are short on numbers around the breakdown is sometimes they overfill a breakdown Argentina and it, four or five bodies are in there and that's where the holes and it's just too much to hide. So again, that'll be those loose forward trios making the right decisions that we saw, you know, like a Sam Whitelock do mm. when they enter these breakdowns. Just to finish on, just to finish on that because you look at around the opportunities that probably the All Blacks have seen in and around that space that you're talking around, Jip, but what's been our DNA when we've won these test matches is going through them to start with. If we want to go out the back early and try to be a little bit too cute, it opens up those opportunities for the breakdown um, of the of the loose forwards from the Argentinians. So going through the mindset, especially in their first 20, uh, is pivotal for us. And it seems it's, it's our DNA to get in these test match results. So that was one thing spoken about a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. England, South Africa. Uh, I think South Africa... Um... And what's the key? I could say breakdown, but I think I'll say squad makeup and how, how they utilise the, the bench and the impact. Um, because England need to spice something up. I just don't think they've, you know, they need, they need like a, a Tuolangi performance, mm. attacking performance that sort of sets them, like a Bundyaki. Yeah, you know, really get them across the gain line in behind the South African defence, which is hard, and that should create opportunities for offloads with that rush D. So, I do think their squad makeup um, and how they bring the game home will be critical, and we know that the South African mm. squad makeup is going to be different. Yeah, <laughs> I'd be surprised if it's exactly the same team. It almost never is. Yeah. No, I just think England, when they have their opportunities inside that twenty-two area, you know, and Jim was saying they haven't very effective so you'd have to think that they're not going to get that many opportunities and so when they do get in there whether that's a three a drop goal penalty or it's a try coming away with points um, is going to be very crucial and very pivotal for that group and I think but the way that they do play not too sure if it's the ref or it might be a bit of rain if it does rain that kick play that they have and the suffocation defensively that they do have they might have a chance but I think there's too much power in that that 23 especially that bench coming on the last 20-30 minutes will be um, it'll be too much for England Right. Well, that's what it's going to look like this weekend, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hard to pick. And when you pick, you've got to be ready to say, I'm sorry, I got it wrong, because this World Cup has been full of big opinions. It's, it's <laughs> the first time Brent and I have agreed. <laughs> the lot. same picks. <laughs> right. So, huge semi-finals. You can catch all of the action and all of the fallout with us on Sky Sport, on Rugby Pass. Catch us an audio podcast as well. Thank you very much for engaging with us. Send us some emails or get into the comments section. Aotearoa rugby pod at sky.co.nz. We're really looking forward to getting into breaking down these semi finals and see who's in the final. Once again, Jibba, thank you very much. Cheers, and Bryn, enjoy your Bronco. I'm sure you're going to love running this afternoon. Yeah, hopefully, boys, hopefully I can come in next week and tell you that I uh, got a good score. So 
Yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs> and thanks, Joel. See you next time here at the Aotearoa Rugby Pod, Matewa.